Hi guys, so today we will be reading Parrots over Puerto Rico. So as you can tell, the title is not on this front cover, which I don't know why they did that. But if you flip a couple pages, first of all, they have the acknowledgements page, which has some beautiful birds on it. The next page has the title, Parrots over Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is part of the United States. It's not a state, but it is a territory of the United States. And it's an island country south of Florida. Okay, so we're gonna start right here. We see lots of jungle. Above the treetops of Puerto Rico lies a flock of parrots as green as their island home. If you look up from the forest, and if you are and you're very lucky, you might catch the bright blue flashes of their flight feathers and hear their harsh call. These are Puerto Rican parrots. They lived on this island for millions of years, then they nearly vanished from the earth forever. This is their story. Okay, if you look closely, you might be able to see a couple. There's a kind of a glare, but you can kind of see some of the birds if you look closely in those jungle leaves. Long before people came to Puerto Rico, hundreds of thousands of parrots flew over the island and the smaller islands nearby. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called as they looked for deep nesting holes in the tall trees. Down below, waves through the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean washed the island's white sand beaches. Delicate orchids and orchids and wide spreading ferns, tiny tree frogs, kapok trees bursting with seed pods and big, scaly iguanas covered the land. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called as they flew to Sierra palm trees to eat their dark, bitter fruit. Around 5000 BCE, people came to the island in canoes from lands to the south. These people planted corn, yucca, sweet potatoes, peanuts, and pineapples. When they looked up, they saw the bright blue flashes of flight feathers. More groups of people came. The Tainos arrived around 800 CE, or 80. They hunted the parrots for food and kept them as pets. Tainos gave the parrots a name, Iguaca, after their harsh call. They gave the island a name too, Borique. So we see here, Lots of people are beginning to settle into this land that was only known by parrots at one point. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called when hurricane winds blew down the old trees where they had their nests. After the hurricanes passed, the parrots flew through the treetops to find new nesting holes. Christopher Columbus sailed from Europe to Borican in 1493 and claimed the island for Spain. We know this that Christopher Columbus liked to claim a lot of things that weren't necessarily his. Soon, Spanish settlers were planting crops on the island and building houses and schools with wood, bricks, and stone. Each time hurricanes destroyed their homes and schools, the settlers rebuilt them. The Spaniards called the parrots Gotoras, and they gave the island a new name, Puerto Rico, which means rich port. So I'm gonna ask you a question. When you're looking at this illustration, what do you notice in these illustrations? What is unique about them? It's hard to see because we're not in person, but I think there'll be something that you'll be able to notice about a lot of these illustrations. In the treetops, the parrots searched for mates. The new pairs of parrots sat on branches, bowing, calling back and forth to each other, and fluffing their wings and tails. Each pair raised one family of chicks every year. Now people from many other parts of the world came to live in Puerto Rico. In 1513, Africans were brought to the island to toil as slaves under the hot sun in fields of sugarcane and other crops. More people came from Spain too, and they married Tainos and Africans. They called themselves Boricos, people of Borican, but they were still ruled by Spain. Okay, so 
Hopefully you can see the birds and the people. Lots of branches, lots of birds. Iguaka, Iguaka, the parrots called when red-tailed hawks cha chased them in the treetops. The parrots flocked together to protect themselves from the hawks. For centuries, people from other countries in Europe tried to capture Puerto Rico. These countries wanted to control the deep harbor at San Juan, the capital city, where merchant ships and warships could be launched. The Boricuas protected the la their land. Starting in 1539, they built a fort that grew and grew until its walls were 18 feet thick. For hundreds of years, no country was able to take Puerto Rico away from Spain. So, at this time, I'm going to ask you, why do you think other countries wanted to control Puerto Rico? Okay. As we continue on, I want you to pay attention to who settles in Puerto Rico and how it affects the parrots. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called when they found their nesting holes had been invaded by creatures brought to the island by settlers. Black rats from the settler ships climbed the tall trees and ate the parrots' eggs. Honeybees that had escaped from hives swarmed into the parrots' nest. In 1898, the United States declared war on Spain. The war was really about Cuba, another of Spain's colonies, but the fighting spilled over into Puerto Rico. Thousands of American soldiers landed on the island and began battling Spanish troops. Spain lost the war and lost control of Puerto Rico. The island became a territory of the United States, and in 1917, Puerto Ricans became U.S. citizens. So we see here, there's a lot of fighting. Also notice an American flag right there. On to our next page. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called as the forests where, where they made their nests were cut down. The parrots began to disappear from places where they had flown for millions of years. By 1937, there were only about 2,000 Puerto Rican parrots living in the Loquillo Mountains to the east. A few years later, the parrots were living in just one place, El Yunque, a tropical rainforest in, one, in those mountains. After Puerto Ricans gained American citizenship, many of them moved to the United States. Those who stayed in rural parts of the island built houses and farms in the area where parrots had once lived. Many of the parrots' tall old trees were made into charcoal to use for cooking fires, and people still hunted and trapped the parrots. In the 1950s, birds called pearly-eyed thrashers moved into the rainforest and tried to steal the parrots' nesting holes. Like clever thieves, these birds enter places where other birds are struggling to live and compete with them for nest sites. The parrots fought the thrashers, jabbing at them with their sharp beaks and defending their nests with harsh cries. But the parrots now had too many enemies and too few trees. The flock became smaller and smaller. By 1954, there were only 200 parrots left. Puerto Ricans elected their first governor, and the island became a U.S. commonwealth. Not a state, not an independent nation, but something in between. People argued, should their island remain a commonwealth? Should it be a state? Should it be independent of the United States? Everyone had a different idea, but all were proud to say, Yo soy Boricua. I am Puerto Rican. See here, the thrashers taking hold of the parrots' nests, and we also see lots of buildings coming up. The flock of Puerto Rican parrots became even smaller. By 1967, only 24 parrots lived in El Yunque. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called as they looked for some place, any place, to find food and nesting holes for their chicks. Puerto Ricans looked up and saw that their iguacas were almost gone. People had nearly caused the parrots to become extinct. Now people started to help the parrots stay alive. In 1968, the governments of the United States and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico worked together to save the 
to create the Puerto Rican Parrot Recovery Program. Its goal was to save and protect the parrots. The first part of the plan was to create an aviary, a safe place to parrots to live and to create chicks. Parrots squawked as scientists with long-handled nets gently lifted eggs and chicks from their nesting holes. The scientists always left at least one egg or chick in each nest so some birds could continue living in the wild. In 1973, Luquillo Aviary opened in El Yunque. Incubators in the aviary kept the eggs warm. The Puerto Rican parrots raised in captivity had no experience as parents, so Espanolan parrots helped raise the chicks. These parrots come from the nearby island of Hispaniola. They are like cousins of Puerto Rican parrots, but, not, are, but aren't as rare. Once hundreds of thousands of Puerto Rican parrots flew over the island. By 1975, only 13 parrots were left in the rainforest. The worried scientists built spe special nesting boxes and put them in trees in areas where the parrots were likely to nest. The parrots inspected the nesting boxes and then moved in. These nesting boxes were deep and dark, like the nesting holes Puerto Rican parrots find in the wild. A bird sitting at the top of the box could see all the way to the bottom. Pearly-eyed thrashers like to see the bottoms of their nests, so the thrashers left the parrots boxing ne nesting boxes alone. Okay, so they are trying to create ways for these parrots to survive in the wild once again. Wild parrots squawked as scientists gently placed chicks from the aviary in their nests so the chicks could learn how to live in the wild. In 1979, the very first chick raised in the aviary flapped out of a wild nest into the rainforest. The scientists work hard to keep the parrots healthy both the captive and the wild birds. One chick was rescued from the wild after its wings were badly damaged by gooey slime in its nest. The scientists rebuilt the baby parrot's wings using old discarded parrot feathers, pins, and glue. Then they watched the parrot use its new wings to fly for the first time. By the end of 1979, there were 15 captive parrots. Most had come from eggs and chicks taken from wild nests to the aviary. Hurricane Hugo roared through the treetops of Puerto Rico in 1989. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called as the winds blew down many of their tall trees. The hurricane wiped out crops and wrecked buildings and homes. In the aviary, the scientists worried about all the parrots. What if another bad hurricane blew down more trees? What if the aviary was damaged? I know it's kind of hard to see with the glare, but the hurricane is creating some problems. Iguaca! Iguaca! A new group of parrots squawked as scientists moved them from Luquillo Aviary to a new aviary in Rio Abajo Forest. This forest is less humid than El Yunque, and many parrots had once lived there. Now there are two safe places for captive parrots to live and raise chicks. Rio Abajo Aviary opened in 1993. It had some challenges. Thunderstorms sometimes caused the incubators to lose power. The scientists found generators that kept the power flowing to the incubators. The scientists also tried some new ideas. They kept more aggressive pairs of parrots away from gentler ones, so the gentler birds would not be frightened. They also caged young parrots with adults, so the birds could not see how parrots behave. The number of parrots in the aviary grew. By 1999, Rio Abajo Aviary had 54 Puerto Rican parrots. The recovery program for the next part of its plan, releasing adult parrots raised in captivity into the wild. So we see that these are some captive birds. In 2000, 10 captive bred parrots were released in the El Yunque. It was late spring. The wild chicks had already flown from their nests and the wild adults were still nearby 
where the captive bred parrots could see them and join them. Iguaca! Iguaca! The parrots called as they flew with the newcomers and searched for food. The captive bred parrots had been trained to find food and avoid hawks, but many were caught by hawks anyways. So before the next 16 parrots were released in 2001, they were given extra training. They heard a hawk's whistle as the cutout shape of a hawk passed over their cages. They watched a trained hawk attack a Hispaniolan parrot that was still, that was wearing a protective leather jacket. In time, the parrots learned to stay still or hide if a hawk was nearby. When these parrots were released, more of them survived in the wild. So a question for you guys. Why was it important to give extra training to the parrots? Okay, we go on. The scientists were ready to create a second wild flock. In 2006, 22 captive bred parrots were released in the Rio Abajo forest. The newly released birds formed pairs, found nesting boxes, and raised their chicks. Dozens of parrots have been released into Rio Abajo since then, and they've begun to spread out through the forest. If you look up from the forest and you're very lucky, you might catch the bright blue flashes of flight feathers. These are Puerto Rican parrots. They lived on this island for millions of years, and they nearly vanished on the earth for, from the earth forever. But they are flying over Puerto Rico still, calling, Iguaca! Iguaca! If you look very carefully, you will see some parrots headed in those jungle leaves yet again. Okay, so another question. What materials do you think were made, were used to make these illustrations? I know it's a little hard to see since we're not in person, but um, I want you to guess what these illustrations are made of. Okay, what they used to make these unique illustrations. Okay. And how do you know this book is nonfiction? Okay, since we've read it all, it's pretty clear that this book is nonfiction. How do you know? And we will stop right there.